get started in 2 Chronicles tonight. Pastor had all the good kings and led us up to a high point at the end of 1 Chronicles. And now we're going to dive into a whole bunch of <laughs> reprobate kings tonight. Kind of fits on a cloudy, rainy, ugly day, huh? Talk about some, uh, some kings. But I think there's some positive things to see in 2 Chronicles. And so uh, I've only got 16 pages of notes, but I promised to rifle through them very quickly. Pastor's been teaching me, you know, his 10 and 12 and 15 point sermons. So uh, I've got 16 pages of notes, but we'll try to rifle through them and, um, and enjoy what 2 Chronicles, what the Chronicler can teach us tonight. So would you join me as we pray? And uh, we'll get started. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. Lord, and for what it teaches us. And Lord, I pray tonight as we look at this book that it has so many details in it. That Lord, we wouldn't just see it as ancient history. We wouldn't just see it as, as names that we don't recognize and activities that we didn't, don't fully understand. But we would see your hand in the midst of everything. And that Lord, we would apply that, that knowledge tonight. We would apply it to our lives in 21st century, uh, lives in the world that we're living in today. May you be honored. We thank you for your word, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, uh, Pastor kind of led us through Chronicles and talking about how, if you remember, First and Second Chronicles was actually one book. And so the chronicler, who was probably Ezra, um, wrote one book, and at the time of the Septuagint, it was broken into two parts. First Chronicles, which got us through the reign of David, and then Second Chronicles, which will pick up with the reign of Solomon and take us all the way into the Babylonian captivity. So we're going to look at that tonight. What I want to do is, is kind of rifle through fairly quickly uh, these kings. And so there's some important aspects. I want us to talk about them. Uh, we won't spend as much time on every one of them. But some, there's some important things. And then I want us to come back and look at the theme of the book. And I think we can see God's holiness and God's sovereignty. So bear with me. Uh, if you've got your Bible, we're going to rifle through verses. We're going to, now, I'm going to count up my trade, and I'm very linear by nature. I know that's hard for some of you to believe, but I, I like the timelines. We can just kind of rifle right through the timelines, and we'll look at these kings, and, and hopefully at the, at the end of that, we'll see the thread of God's holiness and his, and his sovereignty. So, other than King David's death, First Chronicles really ends on a high note. So the, he's, uh, David has raised money for the for the temple. He remember he wanted to build the temple, but God told him he wouldn't, that your son Solomon would do it. And there in, in chapter 29, we see all this money that he's raised and David's fantastic prayer and the assembly. And, and things kind of end on a high note as we, as First Chronicles, as that book closes out, that section of the Chronicles closes out. Well, things begin fairly positively in Second Chronicles. We see Solomon um, and all that they'd get, the people, again, had given willingly to the building of the temple. And so we pick up in chapter 1 with Solomon there in Gibeon, and he's worshiping. And it, down in verse 7, uh, he says, And that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. Now most of us would have asked for power or money or fame or whatever. But Solomon said, And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David my father, and have made me king in his place. O oh Lord God, let your word to David my father be now fulfilled. For you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. And this is what he says. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours which is so great? Solomon said, God, this is a task way too great for me. Would you give me wisdom and knowledge so that I can govern these people? He recognized that he doesn't have the power and the ability to govern these people. And so he asked God for wisdom and knowledge. And then God says, because you didn't ask for all this stuff, I'm going to give it to you anyways. And then in verse 14, you begin to see all the wealth that Solomon was given and the, the money and the chariots and the horses and all the things that he was given. And then we go to chapter 2, and Solomon begins to prepare to build the temple. So in, in, verses two, in chapters 2 rather through 7, we see him building the temple and all the accoutrements in the temple. We see the temple's furnishings. In chapter 5, we see that the ark is finally brought to the temple. What a glorious day that was when the ark of the covenant was brought to the temple. We flip over into verse 6, in chapter 6 rather, and Solomon blesses the people. And, we'll, and then he, his prayer of dedication. 
And then we have the dedication of the temple, and we'll come back to that, uh, chapter 7, toward the end. And then you see in chapter 8, we see some of Solomon's accomplishments. In chapter 9, we have the Queen of Sheba. If you remember the, the story, the Queen of Sheba comes in and recognizes how great and vast Solomon is and all the wisdom that he has and his wealth. And then at the end of chapter 9, we see Solomon's death. And the chronicler writes, he says, Now the rest of the acts of Solomon from first to last, are they not written in the history of Nathan the prophet and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shalonite and in the visions of Iddo the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And now Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. So things went well for 40 years after David died and he reigned. Solomon reigned with wisdom and with uh, intellect and discernment. But boy, do things fall apart in chapter 10. It didn't take long for Solomon's son Rehoboam to really mess things up. So he goes to Shechem and uh, he's there reigning. And remember, the kingdom is still one. There's still one kingdom. It's all 12 tribes. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, he heard that Rehoboam was going to become king, then he returned from Egypt and he sent to him. And, and so he sits down with Solomon, I mean with Rehoboam, and he says, Your father, that's Solomon, made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam says, Come to me again in three days, and I'll let you know what I'm going to say. So Rehoboam goes, goes away, he sends them away rather, and he gets his counselors together. And uh, he gets the older counselors and they tell him, look, you need to lighten up on the load. They're going to come to you and if you do, they will serve you forever. But then he goes to the young guns in the, in the room and they said, no, we ought to make, you need to show them who's in charge. This is your time to be the king and, and, and set things up. And, and so Rehoboam goes to them and he tells them that's what is going to happen. And then of course quickly, he takes that bad advice and they rebel and it says in chapter 19, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That's the split of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the southern kingdom is uh, Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom is the other ten tribes. And it's a little confusing sometimes when you read it's Israel and Judah. You'll, the, the chronicler will sometimes intersperse them. But he, he's always talking about the southern kingdom. Because it's interesting that in 2 Chronicles, the chronicler never mentions any of the kings except in passing from time to time. He never mentions any of the kings of the northern kingdom because he's focusing on the southern kingdom. Um, and you'll, you'll see that how that's going to play in later. But uh, so Rehoboam splits them. And then in chapter 12, we get a little bit more of a uh, little under, more understanding of who Rehoboam was. So when the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, look at what he did. He abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So we get the first taste of who Rehoboam is. The chronicler says that he abandoned the law of the Lord. His father, Solomon, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Rehoboam, his son, abandoned the law of the Lord. So then Shishak from Egypt comes and invades and... Um, then Rehoboam humbles himself and repents, and the Lord delivers him. And um, in chapter 13, then, so Rehoboam dies, and he slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And then Abijah, his son, reigned in his place. So Abijah became king, becomes king, and he begins to battle Jeroboam. This is one of the few times that the northern kings are listed. He battles Jeroboam, who is the northern king, and he prevails. You see that in, in chapter 13. And so now there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam, he wins that battle and he prevails. And then it says the rest of the acts of Abijah, his ways and sayings are written in the story of the prophet Iddo. Now we get to chapter 14. We get the king Asa. Abijah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land had rest for 10 years. And then we pick up in, chapter, in verse 2 of chapter 14. The chronicler writes, And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. 
He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherim and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandment. He also took out all the cities of Judah, the high, out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. You're going to see a theme as we go along. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and the, king, the land had rest under his kingdom, under his kingship. So he, he becomes this good king in chapter 15. He goes on, he talks about the religious reforms that he put in place. He removed the idols. And then we pick up in chapter 16. This is how serious he was about this reform. Even Micah, his mother, King Asa, removed from being queen mother because she had made a detestable image for Asherah. So he, he kicked his own mom out and lo she lost her title as queen mother because she refused to remove, and she rather had made an image of the, a detestable image for Asherah. But it's interesting. And he says he took it and he cut down her image, crushed it and burned it at the brook. Kid her. Now, hey, this is a strong act when you take your mother's idol and you crush it and burn it and remove her title. But in 17 it says, but the high places were not taken out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true all his days, and he brought into the house of God the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels, and there was no more war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. So he, he comes in and he removes these idols, but he didn't remove all the high places. And you're going to see this theme all throughout Chronicles. Most of these kings would get right to the edge and they would do all these good things and then they would leave some things in place. They'd always come back to haunt him. In chapter 16, he, then he takes and he uh, entreats a, with King Hanani, a treaty with Hanani uh, there in, in the first 10 verses of chapter 16. And then in verse 11, the acts of Asa from first to last, or, well, and it goes back and talks, then Asa was angry with the seer, comes in and confronts him in, in verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was enraged because of this. And Asa inflicted cruel, cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. So a seer comes in and confronts him about this treaty, and he gets mad at the seer. That's the, you see that all throughout the Old Testament. He gets mad at the seer and puts him in the stockades. Then in verse 11, the acts of Asa from first to last are written in the books, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. So again, he took all these idols out, crushed them, did all these things, but he left the high places in there. He left these little seeds in there to come back. He says, And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier that had been filled with various kinds of spices prepared by the perfumer's art. And they made a very great fire in his honor. So he was honored at his last death. His death he was honored. Well, now we get to the next king, and that's Jehoshaphat. A little side. Any of you old enough to remember the little children's musical back in the, what was that, Ron? Probably in the 90s, Fat, Fat Jehoshaphat. They had, a whole, they had a whole kids' musical at church about fat, fat. I don't know why I remember Jehoshaphat, but it was fat, fat Jehoshaphat was the, was the musical. So in 17, Jehoshaphat becomes king. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, becomes king, and he reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. So he strengthened himself against the northern kingdom. So chapter 17, verse 3, we get a little taste of who he was. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. So Jehoshaphat goes all the way back to David's ways and walks in his ways. He did not seek the Baals but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. He walked in the ways of David and he had great riches and honor. And in verse 6, his heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and the Asherim out of Judah. He took it a, a deeper level. He took the high places and the Asherim out. So Jehoshaphat's walking in the ways of the Lord. You can see that he, uh, unfortunately, he allies with Ahab. He marries one of his daughters. 
Uh, he, there's a defeat and death of Ahab in, in chapter 18. In 19, you see a little more of his reforms. You see his prayer. And then I want you to go down to the end of chapter 20. In verse 31, the chronicler writes, Thus Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. He walked in the way of Asa his father and did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. The high places, however, were not taken away. The people had not yet set their hearts upon the God of their fathers. You begin to see a theme? He walked, he got so close, he walked all the way in the ways of his fathers, but yet he didn't take the high places down. And because of that, the people had not yet set their hearts upon the God of their fathers. And then you see in, in so it says in 34, it talks about the rest of the acts that you see. And then in 35, Jehoshaphat makes a, um, a treaty, he, this pact. He joins with Ahazai, king of Israel, who had acted wicked, wickedly. So Jehoshaphat, this righteous king, now aligns himself with, with uh, Ahaziah, the northern kingdom's king, who acted wickedly. And this is what it says in verse 36. He joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish, and they built the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eleazar, the son of Dod Dodavahu of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And here's the fulfillment. And the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. So here's Jehoshaphat. He does all these good things. And at the end, he aligns with this wicked king to build these ships because he's going to build great wealth. He's not trusting the Lord, but he's going to use a wicked king to help him build this great wealth and go to Tarshish. And God sends a seer and prophesies and God fulfills his prophecy and the ships are destroyed before they ever set sail. So this is, I want you to keep this in theme. We're going to, we're going to keep, keep going with this. Now we get to chapter 21 in King Jehoram. Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. So it talks a little bit about him. And then we go down to chapter verse 6. And we get a little insight into who Jehoram was. The Chronicle does a great job of reminding us of not just what these guys did, but who they were, what their hearts were like. In verse 6, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab, remember who Ahab, Ahab just, the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is important, verse 7. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. So even in the midst of this wicked king, the Chronicle reminds us that the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. Why? Because he had made a covenant with David. So hold that. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. So he marries this wicked king. He's married to Ahab's daughter. He's not willing to, but the Lord's not willing. And then Elijah comes into the scene in chapter 21, verse 12. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and, in, and have enticed Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom as the house of Ahab, let Israel into whoredom. And also you have killed your brothers of your father's house who were better than you. Behold, the Lord will bring a great plague on your people, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you yourself will have a severe sickness with a disease of your bowels until your bowels come out because of the disease day by day. I mean, the, the Old Testament is very graphic. Some of these diseases, I mean, these, these curses, I don't want any part of those. You know, I, I think I'll, I'll pass on this. So Elijah rebukes him. And what does he do in response to Elijah's rebuke? Go down to verse 19, the second half. I won't read the whole whole first part when he's struck with this disease, this, this incurable disease. 
and he died in great agony. Not only did the Lord take him out, the Lord took him out in great agony. His people made no fire in his honor like the fires made for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And look at this sentence. And he departed with no one's regret. <laughs> what a terrible thing to have said about you. Like what's the old saying, you know, everybody brightens a room, some when they enter, some when they leave. <laughs> he departed with no one's regret. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. So, I mean, this was a bad guy. and Nobody wanted him. So, that's just a, thing, a terrible thing. Well, if you think all oh, that's bad, unfortunately we get to chapter 22 and things really get sorted in chapter 22. I mean, the depravity of man is coming to the forefront as we begin in chapter 22. So Ahaziah becomes king in chapter 22. Uh, verse 4, the chronicler says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done. You see a trend? All of a sudden these kings are following Ahab instead of David and Solomon. For after the death of his father, they, they were his counselors to his undoing. Again, he didn't do what was right. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The house of Ahab became his counselors, and that became his undoing. He even followed their counsel and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to make war against Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram, and he returned to heal in Jezreel. So he, he returns to heal. Um, but the Lord announced Jehu, so in in. in in verse 8, And when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he met the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who attended Ahaziah, and he killed them. He searched for Ahaziah, and he was captured while hiding in Samaria, and he was brought to Jehu and put to death. The Lord ordained Je Jehu to kill Ahaziah. So Jehu kills Ahaziah. They buried him, for they said, He is the grandson of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart. In the house of Ahaziah had no one able to rule the kingdom. That's pretty bad. I mean, things are, are going really bad in the southern kingdom. And then all of a sudden, we get to verse 10 as if things couldn't get any worse. In verse 10, they go really south. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family of the house of Judah. I can't imagine getting up and killing all my family and grandkids and everybody else just because I want to be king or, in her case, queen. But we see, and this is God's providence even in the middle of this, but Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were about to be put to death, and she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So she's preserved him. So we're going to come back to, to Joash in just a minute. So, Athaliah reigns for six years. And she's the only one not of the house of David because she's, uh, you know, she's the mother and not the, the, the king. She reigns as king for these six years. But in the seventh year, Jehoiada, who was the priest, took courage and entered into a covenant with the commanders of hundreds, Azariah, the son of Jer Jeroham, Ishmael the son, and he lists all these kings. And they made this assembly, all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And Jehoiada said to, the, said to them, Behold the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. This is the thing that you shall do of you priests and Levites who come off duty on the Sabbath. And so he takes a third of them and he divides them up. They're going to they're gonna guard the house. And so they guard the house. And, um, and so Athaliah runs to the temple and of course, there is Joash. When Athali down in verse 12. When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord of the people. And when she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance. And the captains and the trumpeters beside the king and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets and the singers with their musical instruments leading in the celebration. And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. It's kind of an odd thing to say. The most treasonous act, she was the most treasonous person in the room, and she's yelling treason to them. Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains who were set over the army, saying to them, 
Bring her out between the ranks, and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, Do not put her to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went into the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, and they put her to death there. So this wicked woman who had rebelled against the house of God, and now she's put to death. And so now um, Joash is the king. So we move into chapter 24, and Joash becomes king. He's seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. And in chapter 2 it says, this is interesting, and Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So as long as the priest was alive, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In, in, beginning in verse 4, he, he, restored, he begins to reinstate the tax that was levied by Moses. And he asked the people, they begin to give and bring back and they restore the temple, they repair the temple. In 24, beginning in verse 15, Jehoiada the priest dies. But Jehoiada grew old and full of days and died. He was 130 years old at his death. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel and toward God in his house. And this is where it turns sad. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them. It's easy. And pride begins to creep in. And they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. Here's this king who had been rescued when he was a year old. God's hand had been on him. And for all these years, Jehoiada the priest, he had listened to him. God had reigned and all these positive, powerful things were happening. And then the priest dies and he listens to these wicked men. And God, even in the midst of that, sent more witnesses to tell him, you're doing wrong. Don't do this. Come back. Then the Spirit of God closed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, and he tried to stand before him. And that didn't work. But they killed him. And then, picking up in verse 23, Joash is assassinated. It's interesting. He goes into battle with the Syrians, and he's wounded by the Syrians, and he goes back to, his, to the palace, and he's laying in his own bed. When they departed from him, leaving him severely wounded, his servants, the old men closest to him, conspired against him because of the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest. Now remember, he had killed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who was loved. And so now these servants turn on him while he's wounded, and they killed him in his own bed, killed him on his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings because he wasn't worthy. And then Amaziah, in, in chapter 25, Amaziah begins to reign. Again, the chronicler gives us a little insight into who, into who Amaziah was. And there in verse 2, he says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet, don't you hate the yets or the buts? Yet not with a whole heart. So Amaziah is this king that's half-heartedly following what the Lord told him to do. He half-heartedly did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. You can see some of his victories there, some of his idolatry. But then down in verse 27 of chapter 25. From the time when he turned away from the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him to Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and put him to death there. And they brought him upon horses, and he was buried with his fathers in the city of David. From the time that he turned... Then the Lord turned on him, and he was killed in Lachish, and he was brought back. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David, but not with the kings. So let's get to the next king. I promise we're rifling through these. I'll get, we're going to bring all the, tie all this together in a little bit. In, verse, in chapter 26, we see the king Uzziah. The king Uzziah that's, that it, 
that Isaiah mentions in his prophecy. And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. So we see that he does that. And then in verse 5, we get a little taste of who he was. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. You see the theme here? Seek the Lord, God prospered the kingdom, brought peace on the land. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. But humanity comes in later in that chapter, down in verse 16. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So here's the king taking the, he becomes strong and arrogant and proud and he goes in where only the priest is allowed to go to burn incense on the altar. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. It takes a, you know, a lot of gumption to walk in after the king who's sitting in the temple. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who were consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer, you know, ready to light the, the, the incense, in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priest, God acts. Leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. Can you imagine standing right there and God instantly curses him with leprosy? And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. The Lord struck him with leprosy. If you remember in, that's important to remember, you can tie that back to Isaiah 6. When you understand what Uzziah's sin was in this leprosy, and you understand that, remember Isaiah says, in the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he's there before the temple. And you get the sense of the holiness of the temple in the, in the altar. And Isaiah in his mind, I'm sure, is going back to this time when God cursed Uzziah and cursed him with leprosy. So Uzziah dies and Jonathan was, his, Jotham rather, his son, reigned in his place. Chapter 27, we see that Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And again, the chronicle gives us a little taste of who he was. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done, except he did not enter the temple of the Lord. But the people still followed corrupt practices. And so... Um, he reigns, you see his reign there in chapter 27. Not a whole lot has told us about him. And then we see at the end of 27, beginning of 28, that Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, I mean, the kings of the northern kingdom, the wicked kings of the northern kingdom. He even made metal images for the Baals. So Ahaz is defeated uh, there by, by, and brought to Damascus. And then we see more of Ahaz's idolatry down in verse 22. I mean, he's been defeated he, by Tiglath-Pileser, has come against him. And then in verse 22, this is interesting to me. In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord. In the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless. The sin of pride. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him. So he, he knows what's right. And he's, he's been defeated. He's been punished by God. And he's in this foreign land. And he begins to sacrifice to these other gods. These foreign gods, rather. 
and we begin to see his utter demise. Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut up the doors of the house of the Lord and he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking to anger the Lord, the God of his fathers. I mean, here's this man that's just been defeated. He knows what's right. He's been taught what's right. He's, he knows the history of how God has acted. And in the time of his defeat, he digs the hole a little bit deeper and just keeps burying and, and burns the, the things and, of the temple and begins to worship these other gods. And he has slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. He didn't deserve to be there. Now we get to Hezekiah. Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. Hezekiah reigned, uh, began to reign when he was 25 years old and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And in verse 2 he says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. So there in um, Hezekiah reigns righteously. Remember Uzziah's just, I mean, uh, Ahaz has destroyed the temple. And so Hezekiah comes in and he, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, the very first thing he does is he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Immediately, he knows that he's got to repair the house of the Lord. So he goes in in the first year, in the first month, and repairs the house of the Lord. And you can see he restores the temple worship. Um, he, uh, he, he, the Passover is celebrated again in, in, in chapter 30, chapter 31. Um, he organizes the priest. And then in 32, um, Sennacherib invades, but he's defeated. And then Sennacherib blasphemes his God. And I want you to see another pattern. Down in, in chapter 32, verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And he prayed to the Lord and he answered him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him. For his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him and Judah and Jerusalem but Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and in the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Now, what a human thing to do. You're in distress, you're sick, you cry out to God, God heals you, and then you immediately become proud again, and God has to humble you again. I mean, how, like, how much so are we like that? But thankfully, he humbled himself for the pride of his heart, and the Lord did not come upon them, in the, and the wrath of the Lord rather did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Talks about how he had great riches, um, and then and Manasseh, and then he dies, and Manasseh his son reigns in his place. Let's talk a little bit about Manasseh there in verse 30, in chapter thirty-three, brother. The chronicle writes, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This back and forth, back and forth. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. It's interesting that God drives these wicked nations out. He defeats these wicked nations. And then the Israelites, the people, of His own people, decide to worship the very things that were defeated. We, it's humanity. We just don't get it. And then down in, in, in chapter 33, beginning in verse 10, um, it says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh, and to his people, but they paid no attention. And so Assyrians come in, they capture Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And so he repents and uh, he calls out to God. He's returned to Jerusalem. Um, he goes in and he removes the foreign gods. He also restored the altar of the Lord and offered on its sacrifice, on its sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he, and he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. He talks about the rest of his acts. And then he dies, he slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his house. And Amon his son reigned in his place. Uh, verse 21, Amon reigned 
was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. Again, and this is a damning statement here. He says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh his father had done. Ammon sacrificed to all the images that Manasseh his father had made him and several, and he did not humble himself before the Lord as, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But this Ammon incurred guilt more and more. Now what a terrible thing to be said about you. Not only did you not do what was right, but you incurred guilt more and more. And we see his demise. His servants conspired against him and put him to death in his house. And so Ammon dies and now Josiah becomes to reign in, verse, in chapter 34. Josiah is eight years old when he, when he begins to reign and he reigns 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father. And I love this statement. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. He stayed straight. He didn't look off to the sides. He stayed straight and kept his eyes on the Lord and obeyed what the Lord told him to do. He purged the, the foreign idols. He repaired the temple. Um, in chapter 35, uh, well, earlier in chapter 34, rather, the book of the law is found as they're cleaning up the temple. And he says, what is this? And they begin to read the book of law. If you remember that story, and, and they begin to sacrifice. They're beginning to bring their money. They're repairing the temple. In, in chapter 35, he keeps the Passover. In, uh, there in 35, he's killed in battle. After all this, when Josiah prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to meet him, and he dies in that battle. And in verse 26, now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his good deeds, according to what is written in the law of the Lord, and his acts first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. So he died a good king. Even though he died in battle, he died a good king. And his good deeds, of course, are recorded in the book of Kings. So Josiah dies. And now Jehoahaz. And this is when it starts getting, it all starts falling apart now. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. He was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three whole months in Jerusalem. Lasted three months. Then the king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and laid him and laid on the land a tribute of a hundred talents of silver. So the, the king deposes him, takes him off, and the king of Egypt now puts Eliakim, his brother, in his place and changes Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim now becomes the king. But Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in, in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. So then Jehoiachin, so we got Jehoiakim, now, now Jeho Jehoiakim rather. Now Jehoiachin comes in, and he was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned a little bit longer three months and ten days. Jehoahaz had three months. Jehoiachin had three months and ten days. And then that's when everything completely falls apart. And he's exiled to Babylon. And his brother Zedekiah, so now all these brothers, things are, are coming to an end very quickly for these, this kingdom. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet. Remember Jeremiah and his preaching and how he begged the Lord not to take. And he, he preaches to these evil kings who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. Now what a terrible statement. Not only was the king, but all the officers of the priest and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful, following all the abominations of the nations. And they polluted the house of the Lord that he made holy in Jerusalem. And then in, in verse 17, Jerusalem's captured, it's burned. The exiles are taken out to Babylon. 
and we see the fall of Jerusalem. Well, what can we, how do you tie all that together? I think there's a couple themes. In one, there's a predominant theme in God's holiness. God is a holy and righteous God. He said, you do what I tell you to do. Go back to chapter 7, verse 11. God will maintain His holiness. He will preserve His holiness. And so in Solomon's dedication of the temple, verse 11, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules. Again, his statutes and his rules were for his holiness. Then I will establish my royal throne. Your royal, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not like a, like a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you. In this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshipped them and served them, Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. God is a holy God and he demands holiness. And he does it through judgment, righteous judgment. That's what he did. He, he, want everyone, he wanted foreigners to see that this is why I brought this. Because they abandoned my statutes and my rules. So all throughout the kings, you see, when they followed the Lord, God prospered them. He blessed them. When they abandoned the Lord, he rebuked them. Because, and he didn't rebuke them just for the sake of rebuking. He rebuked them, try to get them to turn back. And they wouldn't do it, and so the rebuke became even greater. God is a jealous God, but he's also a God who demands holiness, and he will preserve his holiness. But also throughout the book, we see these wicked kings, these good kings. We see foreign kings. We see the two kingdoms. But we see God's sovereignty. God said all that he would do all these things. So let's turn back to chapter 36. Beginning in verse 15. I want you to see what the Lord fulfilled his hand. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He tried. He said, look, I'm trying so hard to get you to listen. Stop being so stiff-necked and, and hard-hearted and listen to what I'm saying. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought up against him the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took them into exile in Babylon, those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him 
and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. Why? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths all the days that it lay desolate and kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. God's will will be done. He said, I, if you don't do these things, in, in chapter 7, it's, through Solomon, he said, if you don't do these things, this is what I'm going to do. And so for all these years, these 300 something years, they rebelled. God was patient. He had compassion. He sent prophets. He sent priests. He sent messengers and seers to try to get them to repent. They refused to repent. And so ultimately God said, I will do what I said I'm going to do. And Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple's burned. The exiles are in Babylon, but praise God, that's not the end of the story as we know. The good thing is on a dark, gloomy, rainy night, we see this, we end on a terrible note with the, the seas of Jerusalem and the exiles in Babylon, but be back here next week because <laughs> we're going to Ezra and Nehemiah. Things are going to get a whole lot better. Pastor's going to be here and make things a whole lot better, all right? So, so be back next week. He's going to bring good news. <laughs> so, but I hope in the midst of all of this, you will see God's sovereign hand and He is a holy God. And we can trust Him because He has compassion as well. Join me as we pray and then if I can ask you to stick around for just five, four or five minutes. We've got a short business meeting. I'm going to ask Marston Berry, our church moderator, to come up after that. So join me as we pray. Father, it's in Your sovereignty that we take comfort Lord, knowing that even as your word proclaimed, you had compassion on the people of Israel. And so, Lord, I pray that when we are stubborn and hard-hearted and stiff-necked and refuse to listen to you, that, Lord God, we would humble ourselves and repent of the pride of our hearts. Lord, we've been taught your ways, and, Lord, we want to we fo we follow your ways and not look to the right or the left. But Lord, we thank you that even in your times of rebuke, they're rebuked because you want us to be holy just as you are holy. So I thank you for the chronicler. I thank you for what he has written down so that we can know and learn and not repeat the mistakes of our forefathers of old. Lord, we, may you use us this week in our workplaces, in our homes. We look forward to corporate worship on Sunday together. May you be glorified. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.